start the uh, Sorry. Um, it's okay, you see the screen? Yep, we do. Okay. Great. Uh, okay, so I'm going to, to talk at, about something slightly different because I'm going to talk about deep linear networks, but it's quite related to, to the last two sections because there we will see a similar type of sparsity. But of course, in the case of linear networks, because we represent linear maps, the sparsity just means that we a certain bias towards a lower rank function. And what's, uh, what I want to, to focus on is a special kind of dynamics that we observe that leads to this lowering bias, which is a very interesting uh, dynamic where during training, we, obs we observe it and we prove at least to some degree the, the fact that uh, in this regime, uh, the parameters will jump from saddle to saddle during training, uh, learning uh, each time slightly larger uh, solution of larger rank until reaching a solution. And describing this, uh, this jumping from saddle to saddle is a very difficult problem because these saddles can be quite complex, especially in the deep case. But that's what we 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 did in a, in a, in this uh, very recent paper. So so let's uh, so so let's define these deep linear networks. So deep linear networks are just so the fact that you, the idea to represent uh, a matrix as the multiplication of uh, multiple matrix. So here you, we have L matrix matrices, the, and we call the L the, the depth, big L. And then we just define the parameters as being the concatenation of all of the parameters of these matrix, all of the matrix entries. And um, I will focus in particular on uh, what some type called uh, rectangular ne networks, when the number of neurons in all of the hidden layers is equal to some constant uh, W. It, it's just for simplicity reason. Uh, it, 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 it's not particularly interesting, important in the analysis. And um, uh, yeah, and what we are going to focus on is uh, doing then gradient flow on uh, on the costs on the parameters, where we just so we we do in our, our analysis for general cost C, which takes a matrix and returns uh, a general convex C and a differentiable uh, uh, C. And one case of particular interest is the case of matrix completion. So matrix completion, the idea is that you have some matrix A star that you want to, to, to reconstruct, but you only observe some entries of the matrix and you want to recover the missing entries. And what's interesting with this problem, again, is that it's very important to have a, uh, this sparsity or low rank uh, assumption, because if you were to just, uh, if you don't, uh, if you have no assumption about the rank of the matrix or something like that, the best guess that you could make is just put zeros in all of the entries that you haven't observed. And this would be the minimal uh, Frobenius norm solution, which co would correspond a bit, which is essentially you can think of it as the equivalent of the kernel method solution in the, the previous uh, talks. And so it's not able to generalize at all in this setting. And it's what you need to be able to, uh, to, to generalize in this setting, you need to assume, well, first of all, you need the matrix A star to actually be low rank, because if the matrix A star is not low rank, there's little chance to actually recover the, the missing entries. And uh, and then assuming that uh, that A star is, is low rank, you need to find an algorithm to actually find uh, a low rank matrix that actually fits the entries. And this is a very hard problem. We know that this is a NP hard problem. So, so of course, it's, we, we cannot expect to, uh, to, to have a fast algorithm to actually recover this, uh, this low rank matrix, but we can be interested in how different algorithms are able to approximate this low rank solution. And uh, I will try to show you, uh, I will explain a bit how your networks in a certain setting can actually do, do that, at least to some degree. And uh, the, the setting I'm talking about is the, um, so of course, because uh, in uh, linear networks, you have the same transition between uh, very uh, between the lazy regime. And in the lazy regime, you cannot expect any generalization actually in this matrix completion setting because it will actually not learn at all the, the missing entries. And the this lazy regime, roughly corresponds to a very large initialization uh, uh, of the of the parameters and so instead what we focused on is the is an initialization where you when the norm of the parameters at initialization becomes very small and, and studying the limit and uh, before I, I present the result i will show you a bit what it looks like because i think it's a quite uh, inter nice behavior to see so here in the first on the left i plot the the train and test error uh, during uh, training and what happens is that 
we see that at, at the beginning of the training, we see a plateau where the both train and test are almost fixed up to for, for a long number of iterations. And this is not so much a surprise because uh, the origin in, uh, in deep linear network is actually a saddle. And in particular, when we are here in this case, it's a depth four network. So actually it's a, it's a very, it's a non-strict saddle in the sense that the Hessian is zero at the origin. So it's, it takes a very long time to escape the saddle at the origin. But then you would expect that it would, it could just escape the saddle and then converge to some global minimum. But what's very surprising is that we see some subsequent uh, plateaus, this first plateau and then the, the second one. Um, and I mean, it's, it's not clear necessarily just from this plot, what would be the explanation for these plateaus, but you could expect that these plateaus would be explained again by some saddles. But why would the training path be attracted to these saddles? Because in general, these saddles are not necessarily attractive. And that's exactly what we're going to show, the, to show the, the existence of these saddles and the, this path from saddle to saddle. And here I have a plot to, to, to describe a bit what I'm talking about. So in the middle, I showed this is a projection of the tra training trajectory in parameter space. And you see the green line does these kinds of uh, um, this zigzag, where you see it initialized close to the origin, marked with the zero. And actually, the the, the two zones here and here where it, where it does a turn, that's exactly the region where you have these plateaus. And uh, what we're going to show, what we showed is that um, there is a first path actually as as the initialization becomes closer and closer to zero along a specific uh, direction, the green path will converge to this uh, blue path, where this blue path is not is a very special path because it's a path that starts from a saddle and converges to another saddle. It's pretty rare. Usually paths, the, I mean, there's very few paths that actually converge to a saddle. Usually they, they, they will maybe get stuck close to a saddle for some time, but then we'll be able to escape. But this blue path is very specific in the, in, in the fact that it actually converges to the saddle and gets stuck there. And then at this saddle, which is represented by the black, these black dots, we find another path, which then goes from this saddle to the next one. And, uh, and the third path going from the uh, uh, second saddle, saddle to the last one, which is a, a global minimum. And, and so the idea is that we want to approximate this uh, complex trajectory of the green line by this sequence of paths. And, um, yeah, and you can see that this approximation is can be quite good because if I plot the, um, the train and test error of each of these three paths, one after the other, of course, because these paths get stuck at the saddle, actually it would, it would take, uh, I put these uh, three dots to represent the fact that there's possibly an infinite amount of time between this first uh, segment and the next one. But you can see that if you glue together these three paths, you get exactly the same uh, loss uh, behavior the exact same dynamics in time as the, the, the green dynamics that we had on the left. And so, yeah, so, so that's what that's the behavior that we, we, we try to explain. We were not able to, to describe everything completely. We were at least able to, to identify what these paths are. And you see that uh, from an authentication, it works quite well, at least in this example. And also to, to prove the fact that from the first, that if you initialize close to the origin, you will move to the first saddle. But um, okay, so before I can explain a bit how the proof works, I need some uh, a few elements the, which are related to symmetries of uh, deep linear networks. So the, there's two uh, types of symmetries which are interesting. Is the the first one is the rotation of a, a linear network. Basically, a linear network you can rotate the all of the hidden layers by uh, an orthogonal transformation, and it will keep the same output and not change the gradient flow. And so I represent a rotation as, a, like, as one rotation for each of the hidden layers. And then you can apply this rotation to any parameters to, to rotate the, by rotating, uh, adding a rotation on either side of the weight matrices. The other type of uh, symmetry that we, we need is the inclusion. It's quite simple. It's the idea that if you have a network with a smaller width W than uh, W prime smaller than W, then you can include this parameter into a larger network by just adding some zero neur neurons un under it. And the nice thing is that, again, if you, after this inclusion, you still represent exactly the same matrix. But the other thing also is that if you, you keep the same gradient flow path, 
And so in particular, if you initialize the parameters on uh, with such as the inclusion of some smaller network, throughout training, you will still say, stay inside this inclusion. And now combining the two, you can take the rotation of an inclusion. And by taking any rotation of some inclusion, you can get taking the image of this map of the inclusion, then the rotation, you get lots of invariant subspace. So these are subspace of the parameter space, where if you initialize inside of this subspace, you will get stuck in this subspace and will not be able to escape. And what's also interesting is this subspace is that even though you are in a width W network, if you initialize inside of this subspace for W prime is equal to one, actually you, the training dynamics is going to look exactly the same as if you were training just a width uh, one network. Even though you are in a width, uh, in a large width network, actually in, a, in effect, you're just training uh, with one network. And basically that's how we, we show the idea is that um, the, 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 the idea for the proofs is that we, um, as we initialize close to the saddle uh, at the origin, actually, the, it's quite natural that if you, it's, it seems in, uh, intuitive, but it's quite difficult to prove. It's also, uh, is that if you initialize close to the saddle, you will escape the saddle along the direction which escaped the fastest. And that's what we call this optimal escape direction. In the, the shallow case, when, when L is equal to two, this escape direction correspond to the uh, eigenvectors of the smallest, uh, uh, the most negative eigenvalues of the Hessian. So it's quite easy to identify them. But again, for deep networks, actually the Hessian is zero. You need to take only the elf derivative is non-zero. So you need some kind of, you can still define this optimal escape direction as some kind of generalization of eigenvectors to, uh, to tensors, which is which complexify a bit the analysis. And then, the, so, the first part showing that that the path that you as you initialize closer and closer to the or to the saddle it's the it's kind of you can show the fact that you you escape along this escape direction but then the next thing is that we we don't only care about the fact along which direction you escape you want to know first you will escape along this direction and then you will follow this uh, blue path that we had and we need to define what this blue path is and that's what we define as the optimal escape path theta 1 and this optimal escape path, so it's it's unique in the sense that it's the only path that escape along the direction, uh, along this optimal escape direction. So this is not always true. So you can look at all of the paths that escape a saddle. And in general, if you choose a direction, there's, there could be many paths that escape along this direction. But because this escape direction was optimal, and also because of lots of other, uh, we need lots of constraints also, which are satisfied, thankfully, for linear networks. But for the for the shape of the saddle, exactly, we're able to show that the that there's actually exact there's a unique path which escape along this uh, direction, uh, this this optimal escape direction, and um, and the other thing is that there's actually multiple uh, escape directions, optimal escape directions, but they are all the same up to rotation, and they are all of the form the inclusion of a with one network, and so if you escape along these directions, you you will escape essentially this, the escape direction lies inside one of these invariant manifolds where you get stuck inside this invariant manifold. But the optimal escape path also, because of this unicity, we can show that this optimal escape path must also lie uh, inside of this uh, invariance of space as described here. And so we know that, so we escape very close. We follow this optimal escape path for some time but then this optimal escape path is going to get stuck at uh, because it behaves just like a with one network. So it cannot learn the full matrix, right? It can only rank, learn rank one matrices because it has a width of one. And so at some point it will get stuck to a local minimum along the width one uh, networks. And, and actually this with uh, this critical point, so it's, it's a local minimum inside the space of with one network, but it's actually a saddle inside the bigger space. And basically, you could just use the same analysis to show that, oh, then you will approach this. Uh, so we are able to show that you approach this uh, second cycle saddle, theta one. And you could use the same analysis to show that you would escape along, again, uh, optimal escape direction, uh, optimal escape path, and then go to another saddle and so on. The only difficulty is that we need to, to, to for this proof to work, we need to, to assume that the, net, that the initialization approaches the, the origin along a, 
generic direction and it's diff we don't have enough control to to control exactly how you approach the next other that's why we cannot apply just apply again the same result and that's why we are not able to really prove the the full uh, step but still we are able to identify all of these optimal escape direction and that's exactly what i used to 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 plot this path uh, to to identify this uh, blue uh, purple and red paths and yeah and so what happens is that you jump basically you will uh, from each other you escape along this optimal escape path, which is unique up to rotation. And each time, because you are in, uh, you always learn a net, uh, matrix, which is one, one rank higher. So it's really like you were, it's kind of a greedy algorithm to try to find a minimal rank solution because an easy way to try to find minimal rank solution is to say, okay, I'm going to try to learn uh, with one network. If it doesn't work, then I try to learn uh, with two network, then uh, with three network and so on and so on until I find a global minimum. And it seems, uh, I mean, in some case, this algorithm could work, but because it's kind of a greedy algorithm, you cannot expect that it will work in general. But under some assumption, you can show that this algorithm would actually converge to the minimal rank solution, which is, uh, as we, but you need to assume something. So it, I, I don't think it's general because again, uh, if it was general, this is a NPR problem. So it's not clear whether this algorithm would be, uh, uh, yeah, can, can satisfy this this problem. Yeah, and so uh, to conclude, so I sh we showed that if you have a small initialization, then gradient flow actually has a very interesting phenomenon where it jumps from saddle to saddle, and it explains the plateau that we observe during training, and and leads to some low rank bias uh, in the end. Thank you. I think I'm out of time. Or oh yeah, I have to to but, but I think I'm I'm done.